welcome back to our channel. This video is going to be about things I wished I'd have known before I started falconry and a few more tips and tricks. So tips and tricks part two. Things that we can show you, simple things that especially newbies don't get right or they don't understand why they're getting it wrong. And of course if no one tells you why there's a reason for doing something the right way, you probably think your way is great even if it's the wrong way. We're actually just about to film a little bit for this week's vlog, but it's given me two things, three things to work on off the bat. Tips and tricks, here goes. When you put your jesses through the anklets, the end of the jesse, the knot end, that's what you'd like to call it, always go through from the outside in, not from the inside out. It always wants to be sitting this way. And I see on social media, people say that to newbies and the newbies say, Oh, what difference does it make? Why? It doesn't matter. It does matter, or we wouldn't do it the right way, would we? The reason it goes this way is that then the pressure on the anklet doesn't cause rubbing on the bird's leg, and it also doesn't cause tangles in quite the same way. So there is a right way and a wrong way, and for sure, always make sure your jesses go from the outside in when they th thread through the anklet. Number two, using a clearance line, Always hand, isn't it? A couple of falconers knots. Always do a couple of falconers knots where you can. You've got a spare. Number three, when you're winding up your creance line or your lure line or unwinding them, there's a correct way to do it. Of course there is. Because people have been doing these things for hundreds and thousands of years. And you learn things that work a little bit better, make your life a little bit easier. So if we are unraveling a creance line, we're pulling it like this, as though it's coming off a spool. We're unwinding it. It stops it twisting and kinking. If we do this, the easy thing to do is this, isn't it? Pull it off the end. Or well, maybe maybe it's not so easy. Pull it off the end. Not so easy because I've wound it up the correct way. So keep pulling it off the end like this, like this. And what tends to happen is your line starts to kink. Now, if you're as old as me, and I tell you it turns into an old-fashioned telephone wire, you'll know what I mean. For the younger ones, let's just say, it becomes a real pain in the butt. Now, if there's a right way to remove the line from your creance line handle, or your lower line handle, then, of course, there's got to be a correct way to wind it up. So this is the wrong way to wind it up. Get rid of it. because this is going to have the same effect as unraveling it the wrong way. It's going to come off and be terribly, terribly kinked. We're using a figure of eight motion. We're running it through here. We're not running it under our feet to create tension and ruin our line with filth, muck and mud. A figure of eight. And of course, to keep it from, look at these kinks from how we did it incorrectly. And as we do this, we can roll the handle round so that the line is stored evenly on the creance line handle. And now and again, turn the handle round. And it'll kind of, look at all this mess here. All because and it's going to form kinks, loops and knots. All because we unwound it the wrong way. Look at this mess. And this is what you end up with you treat your line incorrectly. So always use a couple of falconers knots, whatever you're using falconers knots for. Jesses go through anklets from the outside in and when you're winding line up onto a creance line handle or a lure line handle, you're using a figure of eight motion, you're turning the handle and when you're unrolling you're pulling it off the spool, not off the end. A bird should never know it's on its creance line but of course we don't live in a perfect world don't spike your clearance line into the ground because if the bird does veer off course and you have to use a clearance line to, to stop its progress, you're not trying to go ping and stop it suddenly. You're going to pull its legs out of its sockets. You're going to feather it down so it lands gradually. This is not a perfect area for clearance line work and we're only using it here because A, Zara's a trained bird and B, I'm doing incredibly short clearance line work. So the clearance line wants to go in your pocket somewhere. 
That way, it's secure and you can move and run with the bird and feather the line down. So, there's a nice fence there to fly her from for training. But I've brought a tea perch out here. Seems a bit silly carrying something when there's a perch there. If you train your new in training hawk, thorough, to a fence line, that bird, when you are out in the field proper and it's trained, will spend so much time trying to leave your glove to get to a fence on the hope it can come back for a bit of food. Use a training perch that's specific for that training. That way it won't see such things out in the field and bait towards them constantly, thinking, I'll go there, come back, get a snack. <whistles> Zara. Once your hook's learnt to come for a reward to the glove, stop showing it the food on the glove. You want it to come for food on the glove or to the glove for no food, a big bit of food, a small bit of food. Don't let it hold out by waiting for you to show it a huge piece of food. You want that bird to come to the glove when you call it. On the hope, there's a little tidbit there because remember, the glove's not its source of food. That's just where you want it to start hunting from. And a little snack is a good encouragement for him to come back. Okay, we don't need to do miles and miles. 20, 30 feet is all I ever do on a clearance line. We don't need to do miles and miles. And also, we don't need to do hundreds of call-offs if it's for training purposes. So he's gonna have his last bit of food hidden in the glove. Zara, her last bit of food hidden in the glove. She didn't see how big it is. So a variable reward there. Sometimes there was no food there. Sometimes there was a little betching. And now there's a huge chunk of food. So that way, your bird is more likely to come when you call it straight away than it is if you're showing it bigger and bigger bits of food to get its attention. You'll just hold out until it sees there's something huge there and it will come to the glove just for big bits of food. Another top tip, especially when you watch social media and see what happens. Don't ever use any kind of clip swivel or attachment to secure your bird. The worst ones we see are definitely dog clips horrendous birds of prey will come loose from them easily and they're really cheaply made cast metal they'll break don't ever use anything like this to be honest until you really really know the reasons why you shouldn't use them i'll let you think about that secondly it's really windy today we're sheltered out the wind here we're going to fly zara birds of prey fly in the air it's windy in the air Birds of prey can fly in absolute gale force winds. If we're flying owls, we keep in a tucked away quiet corner. But certainly falconry birds, the wind is their element. Obviously, if you've got a young hawk that's just learning to fly, learning its routine and what its wings do in the early stages and you let it free in gale force wings, winds, it's either gonna be blown away and you're gonna be going a long way to find it, or it's going to try and land in a tree incorrectly and hurt itself as it bashes into the tree. Let your lung, oh, it's, it goes back to this freezing cold again. Let your young hawk learn about the wind as the breeze gradually progresses. But for sure, if you've got a fit hunting bird or a fit display bird, if you let it learn about the wind and it's strong and fit, there is never a day that's too windy to fly your birds for sure, if the environment or the location allows. I keep banging on about it. Learn what the hood's for and learn how to use one. Now, Zara here is a female Harris hawk. One thing female Harris's hawk do quite often is if you train them and fly them yourself and yourself only, especially as they reach maturity two, three, four, five years old, they can be incredibly territorial and possessive over their falconer. It's really good practice to have a friend, a spouse, an adult, I wouldn't say a child, but an adult, to fly the bird with you occasionally so it's used to flying to at least one other person. It tends to help reduce that possessiveness and that territorial pair bonding with their falconer. Because Harry Sorks that are like that will actually fly to attack or possibly attack a stranger or a dog walking into the field that they don't like or they've never seen or that's just interrupting their time flying with their falconer. They can be very territorial. Flying them with someone else that we're going to do in a moment certainly helps to reduce that likelihood as they mature they get to realize that people are part of the social group if you will anyway let's get her out in the wind and get her flying when you remove the leash from your bird 
don't stuff it in your pocket, it'll come out with something else and you'll never see it again. Double it over, have the same place, always put your kit in the same place every time. Doubled over, pass it back through itself, pull it tight, you know where it is, it can't fall off. Oh yeah, top tip number one. Always use at least one radio transmitter or GPS transmitter on your bird. Always use telemetry. One more. If you use a hood, look after it. Use a little hood pouch or have a special hook where it goes. Don't put it in your pocket, it will get squashed. Flying in the wind, be aware if your bird's coming back to you downwind, it's going to overstep the mark, headbutt you, crash. So, cool them into the wind or turn the whole angle of your body and the glove slightly into the wind as the bird comes into land, and it should follow the glove around and land into the wind. Similarly, if you cast your bird off downwind and the wind's strong at a tree line, it's going to go towards that tree line if it's a young hawk and try and land straight forward on, and it's going to crash. That's going to rip out a talon or do with the damage to that bird. You can see how rubbish the lift was there. If you find a hawk, a Harris hawk, red tail, or a goss hawk, and this works exceptionally well with a goss hawk. Hello, Zara. <laughs> this works exceptionally well with a goss hawk for sure. Uh, during the training process, get your hawk accustomed to a recall lure. It doesn't even have to have feathers, it doesn't need to be very big. A lure that you can swing that always has a really good reward. Now, if it's in the training stage, half the bird's food on it for the day and use it at the end at the end of training that way it associates that lure with a massive reward a bird that won't come back from a long distance maybe it's preoccupied maybe it saw an animal scurrying in the undergrowth it can't see it anymore but it doesn't want to give up looking it won't come back to the glove a bird conditioned to the lure will treat the lure very differently from the glove itself and it will return super long distance to a swung lure there's two tricks with this if you're using it in falconry. Number one, always put a big reward on that lure. As soon as you shortchange that bird, the lure loses all its superpower significance. Because if you use it correctly, it is your insurance policy to get your hawk to return. You've only got to shortchange your hawk once by taking the food off because you want to go on flying longer or reducing the food to just a tiny bit. It becomes worthless. Always use a really big reward on the lure. As time goes on, yes, you can reduce that food piece on the lure, but if it becomes a tiny little reward, it will lose its significance. And once it does that, these birds never forget you'll have lost its superpower. The lure works like magic. I had a goshawk fly downhill after the partridge. The partridge put in the other side of a canal, the hawk put it into a tree, and it was watching moorhens scurrying in and out of the reed beds. We're talking, I'm going to say a quarter of a mile away, the bird was a tiny speck downhill in the distance across a canal. It would have took me an awful long time to get there. The bird was also preoccupied. The swung lure had the bird out of the tree instantly, pumping its wings uphill all the way back to me. It would never have done that to any reward in the glove. It has a magical property if you use it correctly. Let's show you. The swung lure, look at it, it's just a little leather pad. Hey! We're not flying into the lure like a falcon. It's simply a reward that has a different significance from the glove. Don't disturb the hawk. Let it, let it treat that as its own special dinner table. When she's finished eating, it will lose its significance and she'll come back to the glove. Big top tip, look after your falconry glove. And it will look after you. <laughs> People, that I know have minging full curry gloves. They don't seem to clean them. It's kind of something you're wearing, and it's also something your hawk or your bird of prey uses as a dinner table a lot of the time. Now, one thing I'll do when I finish with a glove that day or in that moment, I'll take a wet wipe and I'll just wipe off any residues from the feeding. Now, 
one thing, the chemicals in this will do the soaps, will dry out the leather, but we'll come to that in a second. And, you know, there's soap in this. And that's up to you to decide whether you want that on your glove where your bird feeds. I've been doing it since I can remember, and I'd rather have less germs than worry about a little bit of soap. Another thing you can do to clean your glove on a daily basis, maybe in the morning when you first pick it up and it's dried out a little bit, take this kind of wire brush. Now, Jackie's just cleaned this room, do this outside. Purposes of filming, we're doing it inside. Do not tell her it was me. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm over here. <laughs> Darn it. Wire, wire brush, this kind of a really heavy duty one. It's got kind of something. Give your glove a really good scrub. If you do this in the morning, any dry bits of fluff or anything that's still left on there, get in all the little grooves. I'm not going to go too much, I'll get in trouble today, but give it a really good wire brushing down. It gets off a lot of the stuff that's kind of in the nooks and crannies and that's maybe dried on. If you're feeding a lot of day old cockerels, then you will know. They are the messiest food you can probably use and feed. For the the yolk goes like dries like resin. The fluff gets everywhere. Give it a scrub in the morning. Now look at all that lot. Now <coughs> it's not a deep clean, is it? This is daily maintenance. A so scrub in the morning, a little wet wipe down when you finish feeding your birds or working with them. What I've done with all of the gloves I've got that are expensive or cheap, and you again have to decide this for yourself. And you can talk to the guys and girls that made or manufactured your glove if they were, certainly if they were your, in the UK and they were made by a UK glove maker or leather maker, you can actually speak to them directly, I'm sure. Throw them in the washing machine on a short wash cycle. Let them air dry. Don't chuck them on top of your radiator. They will come out stiffer than cardboard, absolutely rock hard, set in place. Let them air dry in a reasonably warm room. And once they've dried, they will be still be very stiff and very cardboard-like. Don't worry about that. Force your hand inside. It, seriously, they'll be like cardboard. Get your hand inside. Get a little drop of Neats for oil. Using your hand, because of the warmth of your hand. We're not trying to drown the glove in oil. Just work this Neats for oil. I say, if you can, if it's not going to affect your skin, you haven't got too much eczema, like I have. Use your hands, because the warmth of your hand will help that oil soak into the glove. When you're trying to rub it in, you don't want to see a soaking wet glove. Give it an oil in all over when it's dried from the washing machine. And within about an hour of use, it will be back to being a supple again, because the oil is going to protect it, it's going to soften it, and in use, you're going to be moving it around. This glove here, I have to say, has a slight defect now. This glove here, I think cost me about 15 pounds and it's now 10 years old. I kind of bought it like I do a lot of gloves as a throwaway glove. But as I've told you in a previous video about looking after your birds, anklets and jesses and such like, if you look after leather, it will last a surprisingly long time. So keep your glove clean, Mine all go in the washing machine relatively regularly. They're air dried and they're in a sort of gentle heat, not on a radiator, and neat for oil. Worked in once they're dry. And that glove is absolutely back in action. Uh, probably ready to last another 10 years, although I don't really want a talent to go in there. Now, any falconer worth his salt would go to great lengths to make sure their bird never bends or breaks a feather. And if it does, it's on you. People say, oh, well, it's, you know, it catches so much stuff, it breaks it breaks its feathers when it's struggling with game. Nearly all the time that happens is because it's already damaged, bent, or fractured a feather to do with your housing, your tethering systems. And that's just a fact. But at the end of the day, even the best looked after falcon bird is going to break or bend the feather occasionally for sure. And if it breaks that feather and it snaps, there's nothing you can do to repair it other than imp the feather, which is um, for another video completely. But if it just bends a feather, which often happens, sometimes overnight the bird will preen that back straight, but if it's a serious bend like that, it's unlikely to straighten it out properly. And there's a simple way of doing this and fixing this instantly, but over time it will make that feather more and more brittle. So it's something you're hoping to do as an occasional thing. But a bent feather dipped into very hot water, not boiling, but hot water's usually not hot enough, very hot water, 
is an instant repair. Now, it's up to you, your health and safety. So I used to use a, an old fashioned glass milk bottle, hold it, hold it, hold it, uh, holding with a tea towel. Um, I use plastic water bottles, which pretty much collapse with very hot water in them, but usually enough. Because if you're using something like this, full of really hot water, it's very difficult to get the one feather in. So let's say it's a tail feather. If you dip the bird's whole tail or several feathers in there, you'll make another feathers more brittle that don't need repairing. So some way of getting this, just a single feather, into very hot water. I can tell you now, it's freezing here, and this water isn't hot enough. Right, I've got to cut that and do all again. <laughs> take two. All I did with take one was spill water everywhere. It's that cold, but the few minutes it took to get this video going, and it actually, the water cooled down too much. It does have to be quite hot. Now, I bent it again now, two bends, it's already wet. This is a bald eagle feather. Quite a tough shaft on the feather. As if by magic. Look at that. It is like magic. Try it on a malted feather if you've never done this before. It just pops back out. Absolutely perfect. I can just feel where it was, but you can see it's not creasing on the crease anymore. Two of them. Absolute magic. But it does over time if you keep doing this to make the feathers brittle. But it's certainly get out of get out of jail for free on a bent feather. Interesting stuff. Now imping feathers is something any falconer should learn about, but as I say, that's that's too detailed for this short video for sure. Now if you are still using a leash that looks somewhat like this for your full curry birds, let's just let's just make this up really quickly. Cut the end off there, melt it over. There's your leash and there's your stopper. Then I can tell you now, if you're using your using a leash like this and you're tethering your birds, this this along with an over large swivel. People buy swivels that are way too big because they're paranoid about the swivel breaking so they sort of over engineer it um, which is a good idea if you're buying cheap rubbish as a swivel but if you're buying something say quality British made stainless swivels you don't need to go giant on your swivels. The way this slips through the swivel and hangs down like this and if you, you'll know what I mean if you use this this becomes the number one reason that your birds of prey get tangled up when they're tethered. This bit as a bird baits starts wrapping up and twisting up through its jesses. Get rid of it, we don't need this kind of leash anymore. Get yourself a loop leash. Now, the good braiding manufacturers make the best loop leashes, I think, a really quality bit of braid. A braided loop leash is brilliant. And there's some pretty good, I actually like, as much as I love my braided jesses and extenders, I do really like paracord loop leashes. Basically, it's a leash with a loop in the end. Now, this is polyester rope, isn't it, that you get from a, a, a hardware store. A loop leash is a leash with a loop in the end, isn't it, like this. It's fantastic, because when that goes round through your, the base of your swivel, it's perfectly tight all the time. It can't slip through or use it, cause a tangle. But of course, making one yourself like this, you've got something that makes it a real problem and that's a huge great knot it doesn't matter even if you use very very thin cord now the only ones i get away with is very thin cord for micro raptors because it's such thin cord that the knot's really small and the only other one i use them for that are homemade like this is for my golden eagle because this big knot has no effect whatsoever but generally if you make them yourself the knot is the problem paracord and braided loop leashes, the very way they're made and crafted means you don't have this knot here. If you're still using a leash with a big knot on the end as a stopper, for goodness sakes, shell out a few quid, get yourself a paracord loop leash or a braided loop leash. They will transform the safety of your tethered bird for sure. Hope you've enjoyed this instalment of Top Tips Tuesday. There's plenty more we'll add as time goes on. Uh, there'll be a sequel, I'm sure. And, of course, check out the rest of the videos, like and subscribe. Thanks a lot.